was a dark and gloomy weekend for the Guardians news-wise, but just like the solar eclipse, the sun shines again, and it shined for Cleveland in their home opener. We'll talk about the Guardians' historic home opening win, moving to 8-2. and two. We'll talk a little about the minor league system over the weekend, and we'll get to a college baseball MLB draft update all on today's Lockdown Guardians. You are Locked On Guardians, your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the game today. Game, welcome to the show today. Uh, today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Uh, download the app, uh, download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Lockdown MLB, all caps, all one word, for twenty dollars off your first purchase. We are users of the app. Go check it out; it'll save you money. Who doesn't want to save money? Uh, I am Jeff Ellis, one of the Thank two hosts events. of Lockdown Guardians. Just finished my fifth. I guess just finished my fifth year, starting my sixth year here at the network for that. It was a lead draft and prospect analyst at scout and 24 seven. And if you've read a Cleveland sports blog, I probably wrote, wrote for him. Nope. Wrote for them at one point in time. Uh, but enough about me, Justin. I am also one of the co-hosts of the show. I don't have as many years as you, Jeff, but hopefully I'll get there. People will keep me around. Uh, I was the managing editor of guardian slash Indians baseball insider for a couple of years. I've also written at various blogs in Cleveland. I also freelance for the News Herald and the Morning Journal, covering the Guardians and their farm system. And I am here with you, Jeff, talking about, let's just, I know this is a Guardians podcast, but let's just talk about a minute for Cleveland again in the spot. I know, I know you no longer live in Cleveland, unfortunately. But I do not, unfortunately. The NCAA Women's Tournament was in Cleveland over the weekend. It was packed. People were having fun. It was a good matchup. I don't know if anybody watched but people were in Cleveland. They were talking about how great it was, to how the city was to, to as a host. And then we had the home opener, obviously, at the Eclipse on Monday. Just a lot of positive news for Cleveland over the weekend. I know the Shane Beaver news was not positive. We'll talk, we talked a little about that yesterday. We'll talk a little bit more maybe about it today just because he had a press conference and it was very sad. But let's, let's, sad. Give, let's, let's, let's let the sun shine as it did after the Eclipse on Monday and mm-hmm. Just talk about what a great weekend it was. You had great weather for the opener, um, you had great weather for the eclipse because you know it could always be cloudy in Cleveland, so you might not get to see the eclipse. Very cool moment. I was outside during my work day to watch it. I did not go to the game, unfortunately. Um, I wish I would have, but I, I bought into the theory that it was going to be too crowded, and it turns out it was a pretty normal day, but just a good weekend overall for the city of Cleveland itself. The Guardians are playing good, good weather for the eclipse. The home opener, the, women, the women's tournament was in Cleveland. All positive things there. Of course, the Guardians moved to eight and two after beating the hapless Chicago White Sox. They are a sad sack. You know, we were we were pretty down in our fields yesterday, and we were doing a little bit of therapy about the Shane Bieber situation. Could be the White Sox. They have a really. I know we get people commenting on on stuff saying how bad the Dolans are about owners, and you know we always say, are they the greatest? No. Are they are they the worst? Absolutely not. The White Sox ownership is bad. Their team is bad. It is a sorry franchise. It's, and remember, if, as you're, I don't know if I can that, do lockdown White Sox. Yeah. Well, no one does. Uh, that's why there's no host. Well, yeah. It hasn't been since last August. But uh, yeah, I, just as you watch the game, remember that the highest contract they have ever gave any player is Andrew Benintendi. That's 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 the highest. Yeah. That is one of the few two teams right that has never given a hundred million dollar contract. It's it's sad. It's, bad. it's pathetic. But that is uh, Reisendorf. That's why he's one of the bottom five owners in this league. And for as much as people complain about Dolan, again, we're not saying he's top five. We're not even saying he's top 10, but that bottom five is so putridly bad um, it that it's a really hard fight yeah. to make it. It's, it, you know, at least he has continuity and gets out of the front office's way. That That is, mm-hmm. this team was on the rise and then Reinsdorf decided to rehire his best friend and implode. <laughs> everything Ooh, like yeah, it's crazy direction. like they had their they, this is supposed to be their time and uh yeah that hasn't happened it's over we don't need to kick them anymore to make ourselves feel good because despite the shame beaver news we should feel good because the guardians are eight and two it was a, a good win on the, during the home opener a good day for cleveland overall and a good weekend as we said and 
I know people are going to say, well, the White Sox aren't any good. You better beat them. But as we said about Oakland, you know, you've got to beat the teams in front of you. And it's not like they're barely scraping by with one nothing, two to one wins. They're not giving, you know, Oakland. I know they lost the final game of the series, but Oakland just took two or three from the, from the Tigers last week. So the Guardians are at least putting some distance most games themselves from these bad teams. Right. So you can feel good. They, they have a plus 36 run differential. That's what you want to do is you. I know those don't count for wins, but. If you're going to play teams like this, you need to beat teams like the way to, to suggest you're better than them. And that's that's kind of what they did. I want to shout out first Andres Jimenez, man. Every every game at this point is becoming the Andres Jimenez show uh, every day. I know this is not a, a way to really look at war. And I know people are all like, who cares about war? And, and in season, it's not a perfect thing to look at. But Andres good Jimenez, for absolutely game, nothing from what I've been told in game yeah 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 depending on how you want to look at it but every day every game he is making a winning play it's either good base running um the ball today that that had just hit for a line drive off the pitcher he got back to second base on and then he got to third and scored on a good read he he is a good base runner i was only got one steal so far but he had two hits again today he had a, another hit by pitch with the bases loaded that gave him an rbi like or was it? Yeah, I think it was an RBI. Just every day, whether it's the glove, base running, or at the plate, Andres Jimenez makes some kind of play to help this team win. He does does it all, and just taking off this year. I know some of the things may be unsustainable. I mean, he's got a three thirty three BABIP, which it's not that terribly high, but it's also maybe not sustainable. And the walk rate's lower. not what you want, but he gets hit by a pitch a lot, so. But, but again, every day I just feel like he is doing something out there that helps this team win. You can just – you can see it on the field. The things he's doing leads to runs, and it leads to uh, saving runs in, in one term or another. It's just – it's been a great uh, great start to the season for him. It, and I think what we're seeing with him too is go back to last year and what didn't work. Go back to two years ago and what did work. Looking at this year and what has worked, he's hitting the ball hard again. Like the, the thing that was missing last year was a lot of weaker comp- contact – and I do think that he is a guy who needs confidence. Like we have seen throughout his career, he sure. is a player that it feels like when when things started out bad a year ago, he never got out of that confidence hole that he dug for himself. So right now he's got confidence and he is just leaning back, hitting the ball hard. You know, the defense never rests. That is a part of his game. You know, you know he won a platinum go- gl- glove for a reason. <laughs> um you know, he's a he's a good defender. He runs well. It is weird. He doesn't have more stolen bases, but it's because he keeps hitting so many doubles. That's that's my theory. But he's hitting the ball yeah. hard. He's hitting with authority. Um, he is, you know, since opening day, has he hit lower than second or third? Like, I feel like they dropped him in the two he hole. Hit seventh. He hit seventh today uh, okay. against the White Sox because they started a lefty in a bullpen game. Yeah. So unfortunately, as I was telling Justin, um, I had kid issues, so I only got to watch the second half of this game. Um, so he did not get to see the the very beginning of it. But uh, yeah, I mean, he's I think he's responded well to hitting at the top of the lineup as well. I think like let's not mess around with it. Let's put him up there. Mm-hmm. Let's let him hit. But he's yeah, he's been one of their most consistent players game to game. And I think his his double today was off was off Tanner Banks, the lefty and his. I don't know what a second hit was off of, but uh, it was the first was off a, a lefty. So continues to not have any platoon issues. Let's stick with the offense. I was going to go to McKenzie because that was a story, but we can get to that. Another three hit game for Stephen Kwan. The numbers look really weird right now in terms of the strikeouts yeah, and walks and they're all over the and the BABIP. But yeah. he now has five. Was that four? One, four three hit games to start the season. And yes, yeah, some of this this will you know even out. Hence the BABIP. Got to give credit. Yeah, but got to give him credit. He is doing a good job getting on base to start the year, and that's what you want a leadoff hitter. He looks like he's just taking confident swings, and boy, when your leadoff hitter gets on base three times, it's uh, that's a good recipe for winning, at least. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like He is going to be probably a league average, a slightly above league average bat. There's going to be a regression. He's got a stri- uh, not a strikeout, but his walk ratio is Oscar Gonzalez-like right now. Um that's just not going to be sustainable. He does have a, you know, an ex preternatural ability to make contact. So it is still hard to strike him out though. His strikeout rate is a little bit higher for him. But that's because he's, he's taking some more risks. He's doing some positive things. You know, he's going to be mm-hmm. a solid contributor. It's going to be that way. At some point we, we will see the BABIP gods intervene. Um, 
you know, they, they are capricious and cruel. Average. They're capricious and cruel gods. Go ask Nolan Jones. And uh, th that's, you know, it, I mean, it's what happens. We know it's going to happen, it is. but it he is, is going to find a way to be a solid contributor all year. And that's the thing. Like a year ago, we were begging for, for solid contributions because there were some struggles for Quan at the start. And when you got Quan back, you know, being Quan, you got Jimenez closer to normal. You got Josh Naylor playing well. And then, you know, Freeman stepped up again. And a lot of guys continuing to be, it's a much, much, much more balanced lineup. Again, it's 10 games. I will speak his name. Owen Miller has taught us well that like a lot can change after a good three week start. So we'll have to see how it goes on, but this is fun. Let's just enjoy the fun and see who can maintain it. You know, not everyone's going to, some guys are going to fall off a little and then, uh, you know, figure out how they can, but when they do, that's why you got Manzardo and the lot of rate waiting. So, you know, it, it's the nice thing where even if, if guys have regression, even if guys can't keep this up, there is that depth just waiting there. It's in some ways more exciting than what they have. Yeah, those two are not exactly off to good starts themselves, but uh, we can get into that another time. Uh, number to know for next segment, 32.3%. I'll tell you why that's significant uh, coming up here on Locked on Guardians. We just had all these fun events in Cleveland. We talked about the NCAA tournament, the women's tournament. We had opening day, all this Eclipse stuff. There's more stuff coming to Cleveland. Even if you don't live in Cleveland, it's going to be outdoor concert season here real soon. And if you want to get to any events this summer coming up, game time is the way to do it. If you're someone who likes to plan last minute, maybe you don't want to worry about buying tickets ahead of time. Maybe you missed out on a pre-sale. Game time takes all that anxiety away. I, I, making big purchases can give you a lot of anxiety. But game time definitely does not do it. They have killer last-minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat. And, of course, they have the game time guarantee because if you find the same seat in the same row and section for less, they're going to give you 110% of the difference back. Uh, they also have zone deals, all, all kind of good stuff at the last minute. And I love the all-in pricing personally because we've all been to those annoying sites where you buy tickets and you think you're paying 80 bucks or 100 bucks for two tickets and all of a sudden you get to check out and it's like $200. You're like, where did that come from? You don't have that with game time. You know what you're going to pay out the door before you get to the checkouts. So there are no surprises. I love that about them. I love being able to see my seat before I buy it. I bought home opener tickets a couple of years ago to go with my family and um, got there and the tickets weren't what I thought they were because they were standing room only. I took my dad that year and he was not able to stand for nine innings. So that was not good. Don't have to worry about that with game time. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time for a limited time. If you want to go to a baseball game right now, all of our users can get $20 off any MLB purchase of 150 or more in the game time app with the code first pitch, all one word, all caps, Terms apply. That's app code F I R S T P I T C H for twenty dollars off from March twenty fifth to April fourteenth only. So that deadline's coming up to use this code. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. All right, Jeff, thirty two point three percent. Why is that number significant? That is Andre Simenez' chase rate so far this year. Last year, his chase rate, Jeff was 40%. And again, it's 10 games. He has seen like 160 pitches or whatever at this point. Okay. So it's, it's, these things are not stable enough to necessarily say that, that uh, this is where it's going to be. But like you said, he is a guy who, who relies on confidence and um, his chase rate, even in 2022 in a great year was 38%. So if he can maintain this 32% rate, which, which is a little higher than it'll be average, which is 28%. Good for him, though. If he can reduce that chase rate, a lot of good things are going to keep happening for Andre Simenez. 100%. Like, he is, you know, because Jose is Jose. He is such a constant. In some regards, Jimenez is the straw that stirs the drink because he is the guy that is the, maybe there's enough variance that he is the guy that's going to have the biggest effect because Jose is a Jose. Josh is kind of Josh. This is the guy that if he approaches his all-star year, then this offense could be special. Yeah, and he is having a special start to the yeah. year. I know some people wanted to trade him over the offseason. I know you know who I'm talking about. Uh, I, I <laughs> one do. of our semi everydayers. Let's. I don't want to be negative. I know people are going to say you guys are always so negative. We we start out with all the fun positive stuff, but Tristan McKenzie he did go five and two thirds scoreless innings today. He only gave three hits. That's good. 
He walked four and struck out two. Only missed six bats. So he he got six swings and misses all day. Um, Not a deal. Only two with the fastball. Yeah. I got to say, with a, with a, he did hit 93 on the radar gun, which I will which say that's huge. encouraging. He averaged, he averaged 92 today with the fastball. So that's a, that's an improvement from his last yeah, night. Because he, he only had what, two pitches over that hit 92 last time? Mm -hmm, something like that. So it was up today over what it was last start. Um, my only thing here is I think a better team probably makes him pay for the walks, oh, they, and I think a better team yeah he gets annihilated takes advantage. So it's it's a, it was a needed start for him, a needed result for him for some confidence. Um, we talked about Andre Semenez needing confidence. Tristan McKenzie absolutely is a guy who needs to feel like his stuff is playing. And and I don't know if this stuff today would have played against a better lineup. We're going to find out next time around because I think he's going to. I don't think he'll be scheduled to face New York in the next series. Yeah, he will. He will face New York, I believe, on Sunday or Saturday. So depending on what the Guardians do with this whole uh, opening spot with Shane Beaver. But yeah, he needed he needed to have a quality result to feel good about himself. I don't know if it would have worked the, against a better lineup, but, you know, it worked today, weird, which is good. weird thing was his spin was down today, so the velocity was up, but spin was down. Um, I agree. He's got he's to gotta generate more whiffs. And he, the – the fastball command, command was better. He had 10 called strikes, which is good for the fastball. That's is good, but you, that was also got to miss more bats. Time. And, yeah. and what f was it? One wild pitch as well, as well as the four walk. Like he just, he can't mm -hmm. do that to himself. He's going to have to, this was still not a good start. Um, I don't know if it makes me feel better or not. Uh, the white Sox are just, just absolutely, absolutely, absolutely putrid. So you're facing a good team. I, I think that they put multiple runs on the board. Um, Gaddis looked was one of the parts I got to see him. Boy, boy, oh boy, oh boy. His velocity went up a little yeah. more. McKenzie didn't pitch, he pitched fine. Like he pitched, he did enough to beat the White Sox, which is all he had to do today. We'll see what happens next time out. But he had the pitcher's best friend, which is a strong bullpen, as Bob Feller used to say. Uh, his velocity was up again today, uh, 3.8 over average. So he was up to 98 today, almost 99. And ironically enough, his changeup velocity was even further down, which means he's getting more separation. He did have a walk, but you know him, Cade Smith, Tim Heron had a walk too. Cade Smith was was the best reliever today by far of the setup group. Classe was fantastic. Classe got five swings and misses against his cutter today, which was fantastic. But when you got a guy like that anchoring the back of the bullpen, and by the way, Classe looks way better this year than he did a year ago. He already had, I think, one or two blown saves at this time. So much kudos to him, not um, getting at a lot of one run games, which has been helpful for Cleveland. Obviously we talked a lot about that, but I, at some point, yes, this bullpen, it's youth and experience is going to catch up with it. I'm not saying it's going to crash down, but I mean, there are going to be hiccups and I think it's going to, I think it's going to be a great bullpen. I do. I just think there are going to be hiccups when you have a Tim Heron, a Hunter Gaddis, a Cade Smith, really, shouldering the load early on and you know before you get henches back and um get some other guys up here but man this young bullpen continues to thrive and i will not be surprised if this bullpen ends the year like i said they're gonna have their hiccups but i think this bullpen is gonna end the year as a very very strong unit i feel very good about this bullpen right now and you know well i know we'll kind of save some of the the talk for the minor league roundup but crazy thing is there's two to three really exciting arms in the minors who could be better than half of what's already up. And yeah, I mean, they, they, they you can't trade relief pitching to get starting pitching typically, but like there's going to be a point where like they're going to have some interesting choices to make. Yeah. And then real quickly too, I wanted to point out, you said Tyler Freeman, uh, Tyler Freeman did have a hit today, but I think more importantly, his center field play was fantastic. Once again, I mean, he was just taking great routes on ball, showing great instincts. It just looks like he, belongs in center field and he's why wasn't this done earlier there. ago was it's it's amazing years ago just go back to like the Ahmed rosario experiment in center field and he just looked lost early right away and Ahmed rosario is a good athlete let's not get that confused he is a good athlete uh he's fast he's quick all that stuff um it's just bizarre like they how, maybe maybe it was how Cleveland handled the switch but Man, it's just it's amazing to see like how quickly he has taken the center field, Tyler Freeman. He just like I said, he looks like he belongs out there, like he's always been out there. It's just it's incredible to see. 
Um, Jeff, I want to talk about some team leaders. Uh, they had Shane Bieber at a press conference before the game, talking about his injury, and Vote had some interesting things to say. And we also got to talk about minor league stuff, and we got to talk about some draft stuff. So we got a lot to cover here, all coming up on Lockdown Guardians. Should I bring bring the shades back down for the first half of this? Uh, so let's talk about our friends over at Prize Fix. They're not going to keep you in the dark. They keep it simple. It's more or less. It's that easy. That's the line for a reason because you're not going up against experts with more knowledge than you and computer programs that help do all the work. You're just picking a stat like wins, like home runs, like strikeouts, and picking more or less. It's that easy. So you're going to go through and use what you know about these players to make money for yourself. And right now they're having some special deals. Uh, spring training is over and baseball season is officially underway. Don't miss your chance to add your favorite players in the diamonds with prize pick entries. Uh, so take more or less and add them to your price pick total. Things like strikeouts, RBIs, or first inning runs. And I, again, it's it's nice that it's just you versus the numbers. It's not you versus a human download the app use the code locked on mlb all lowercase all one word for a first deposit match up to 100 dollars. that's uh prize picks use the app go to the website locked on mlb pick more pick less it's that easy shades on because the future is so bright hey Game two coming up uh, this evening if you're listening to this during the day 6 10 first pitch you can listen to all the action Tom Hamilton and Jim Rosenhouse on your Sirius XM app. Just search Guardians on there. Well, well you know, I, I do study nuclear science. You do? No. Okay. No. no. Give me, uh, give us a quick lesson a, then, Jeff. No, it's 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 a reference to that song. My, my future's so bright, I gotta wear shades. Oh. Oh, man. I should have known better than that. That's embarrassing for me to, to miss out on that one. All right. Well, who is not missing in this clubhouse is the leadership right now. First of all, this press conference from Shane Bieber was a very sad one. I mean, you could tell it, he was fighting back some emotion. Yes. It, it was on the level of the Thor one. Like it was that level of, of sad. It was sad. It was sad. Um, I have a feeling he'll be here. I and mean, I, I know he's got to work on his rehab and stuff, but I have a feeling he'll be around the team and, and do what he can for the team. He sounded like he really wanted to at least be around them at some point this year when he's able to, it sounds like he's going to have the surgery. Hopefully they're hoping by this weekend so we can get to the rehab process. But, uh, you know, we didn't talk the other day about Tyler Beatty and, and this this whole belt thing um, that he's giving mm-hmm. away for every game. And he's emerging as a leader very quickly. I love this quote right. saying that it's hard to win a Major League Baseball game, so there's no reason we shouldn't do something to be happy or celebrate that every game. I'm not talking about, like, champagne showers, but, you know, the belt is a fun way those to, to too, celebrate though. whoever. Yeah, those are good, too. Hopefully we'll, we'll see some of those. And then – uh, you know, vote also point out having hedges in the locker room to having him back is, is super important. So you've got hedges back, which I think is going to make a big difference with this loss of, of Bieber. And then Tyler Beatty it just seems like he is starting to emerge as a team leader. And I don't know what his role is going to look like as the year goes on. It's, it might change now with the Bieber situation, but very clearly he has already shown up in the locker room as something of a leader, which is fun to see. And yeah. it's something that's going to be very needed. Oh, great. It, it's a fun um, Twitter account. You can see him giving people the belt. And I don't know, I, I've read a few other things, heard some things. It's like, he, you know, he knew a few guys coming in, mostly the coaches from his time in San Francisco. And he just mm-hmm. had no problem jumping into this role, even as like a new guy who was fighting for a job to try to like make this more fun and have fun with it. And he's been good. Like he's been another solid contributor. I don't know what the role is going to be all year, like you said, but um, you need especially when things go sideways, like it has early season with the, the Bieber, you need more guys like this. You need guys who are going to keep it, keep them fun. Cause I absolutely love Jose, but Jose is more the quiet leader type by all accounts. Like he's not the guy. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it, it's leading on. That's the where field, they got hedges. Words. Yeah. You know, so that's, they, they need guys like hedges and BD to, to be there. And, you know, to, to have that, it, was it like the pies in the face the one year? And sometimes those silly little Trot things. Nixon, to, baby. Oh, yeah. Seem to, you know, some of that stuff seems to help. And, yeah, I, I appreciate what's going on. They, they seem like a very happy crew right now. 
They do. Uh, the Guardians were 10-2 and two in 2011, by our 8-2 and two after the first 10 games. That season did not end well because I don't think they were really positioned to take advantage of it. I think that's the one where everything fell apart in June, right? Like I, I was living uh, in New yeah, York, they were like, and they were like in they were first place, thirty and then, fifteen or something, and yeah, it all blew up. Uh, so this but it was everything on that team. That. I remember that team. Um, I was living in New York at the time, and I was listening to every game on the radio because uh, I, I paid for the radio, and it was like as much as I didn't want to believe it. Like I could look at the data, and everyone could look at the data and see that it was gonna go poorly. Like that was a team where you and could very did. quickly see. And it did. And the data this year yeah. isn't as negative. So I just want to say that it's early, exactly. but it's not as negative. Yeah. And here's the other thing, too, I want to keep mentioning about these bad like people saying what the schedule and this uh, and you know start that looks like it's a mirage. You cannot win the division in April, but you can definitely lose a division in April and they're not losing it. And you can't take these wins away. The more wins you can bank early on, the easier. Not I'm saying it's not easy, but the better it is for you to to be able to go through stretches later if you build yourself up like this a little bit. So. Um, I know again, we can't, you can't win the division in April, but you can definitely lose it. And so far they are banking some wins, but they should bank and they're doing it in good fashion. Yeah. Andrew Walters, one of the relievers Jeff mentioned, I expect Andrew Walters to be in this bullpen by the end of the year. I truly do. Maybe, yep. maybe August. Um, he was 95, 99 over the weekend and he threw a splitter look, looked really good. He got a swing and miss on that slider was okay, but the fastball is just so freaking hard to square up and swing at. Double A hitters are not ready for that. And it's, I think it's a 70 grade a. at least it is. It's got cut right on it and it's, it, he throws it hard. He, yeah, and he, he has command of it too. That's the important thing. He has like Emmanuel class a command. So yeah, I expect Walters to be in triple a before the end of the first half. And I think after the all-star break, it would not be a shock to see Walters in Cleveland. He is ready uh, very soon. You can see why Cleveland put him in double a to start. Parker Messick, you know, you mentioned yesterday about him. He needs to be in double A. He dominated yeah. his first start in Lake County. He needs to be in double A already. Uh, he should have been up there last year at some point. He is 93, yep. 94 in his first start. Last year, he was like 89, 92. Now he is consistently 92, 94. So big step. He's a little more spelt as that. well. Yeah, which is helping. So um, could become part of the depth here in, in the next year or so. I don't know about this year, but. Hopefully, I want to point out Cleo I mean, Watson. It's been a more very short sample size. Help this they, year. They should be more aggressive. Cleo yeah. Watson has not swung and missed at a pitch yet this year in three games. I know it's only three games, but uh, it's something he's got to do is cut down on, on swing and miss. And he has done that in three games. Look great at the uh, more patience, and he looked good at shortstop and third. So that's fun. Ross Carver and Jack Leftwich both worked out of the bullpen over the weekend. I still think both can be starters, but. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that. But Carver was was great. Two strike, two innings, five strikeouts. Uh, Jeff and I both like him as a breakout this year. And left, which I'm not sure about, but very interesting. All right. Some draft college baseball. Who do you want to start with? Do you want to start with uh, Causey? You want to start with Sears? Gongora? Well, let's, the, do, the let's, do, let's do Causey and Sears together because I have kind of a point to make here. So I was looking sure. at the lowest walks per nine in college baseball. And if you look at the top 30, it is almost entirely guys from colleges you've never heard of. Uh, there is <laughs> Ryan Prager in there. There is um, AJ Kazi in the top 30. And there is Brett Sears. And those are about the only guys from big time. And Jamie Arnold, who's not draft eligible. But keep him in mind for next year. He's going to go high. Yeah. But those, are, those are the only four guys in the top 30 from a college you've ever heard of from a big time conference. Sears, um, we'd start with. Kind of out of nowhere. We did have someone ask about him at the start of the year. He is BJ Goff every day. Or... Yeah, every day he is. Um, you know, a strikeout rate of 9.3, which in college is okay. Like my old joke was like, who are the Guardians going to draft? Look for a walk rate under three and a strikeout rate over eight. So anything in that range, you know, is pretty good. He is older. He is going to be 24 in May, which is uh, like he qualifies for social security when it comes to the draft to be that old. Uh, you know, that that's that's old like that is it's it, if you're 22 you're old this guy's gonna be 24 so you know he's a 10 5 10 000 senior sign type i found his pbr data um not paps but uh prep baseball report and he was like 93 in high school so and all of us they also have spin rate data on all of his stuff like change slider mid 80s all within about the average range for spin his spin data was pretty average so it's like stuff to support like it's kind of surprising that he had to go to a smaller school at first and that you know he's not the biggest guy 
but there's some good data. I mean, he is at his age, he is getting five or 10,000 like that. That's just it. Like he is in that range. But if you need a senior sign with what he is doing, that's, that's fun. AJ Kazi, um, terrible ERA, terrible home run rate, but this team doesn't care about home run rate. I've had that discussion multiple times on this. You can go back and listen to our interview with Hunter Gaddis, where I, I just straight out say to him, it seems to be that this team thinks that the ball's in the air. Most of the outcomes are more often good than bad. He's like, well, it hasn't been stated that way, but you know, I can't, I'm not going to put words in his mouth. But you, you can go listen to, to me talk to him about that. And his strikeouts for nine are over 12. Again, this is an SEC pitcher. Walks for nine, 1.9. He was at Jacksonville State the last two years. He's got two years of data in the Cape as well. Um, not a ton, ton of innings, but you're looking at the overall. He, he's been in the Cape. He's been uh, in the SEC. High level production. Um, and then uh, Ryan Prager threw another gem at Texas HM 13.2 strikeouts per nine, 1.0 walk per nine. He has given up five walks in eight starts. He's also given up five home Out runs. Out of those three, who's coming to the Guardians in July? Which are those three? Uh, Prager. Guess, I think it's Prager too. I yeah, think. he's, you know, he's. He, he's doing it as well in the SEC. He's a, uh, you know, he, he, the other nice thing is he's a lefty. The other guys are, are righties. Um, he's, he missed all of 2023 with, I believe, after Tommy John. So he's already had some surgery, but normally control is the last thing that comes back. His control numbers are unbelievable. Uh, I had that thing with him and Jamie Arnold and Luke Holman as the last guys to give up and earn run as starters. He's been really, right. really good. And yeah, he's, I think he's probably going to go somewhere in that like late two, late two to fourth round. And I just, one more small throughout that I didn't tell you about a guy we talked about on the show before. Who's also on that list is Nick Wisman at Dayton, the weird mm -hmm. side army reliever. So just another That's deep right. senior signed guy to know who's also missing, missing bats and uh, look good against Wake Forest. Yeah, good for him. Shout out to an Ohio kid, Sebastian Gongora. He was the Louisville starter on Friday. Shut down one of the most potent offenses in college baseball in North Carolina State. 11 strikeouts. I think he had no walks. Uh, he's an Ohio kid. He was at Xavier. Now he's Louisville. Uh, wait, lefty. Right, state. He'll probably... right State. Sorry. He's from Dayton. Yeah. He was born in Dayton. So keep an eye on him. My buddy Joe Oyama from uh, UC Irvine. Had, I, think, I think he had six or seven hits over the weekend. I'm uh, just a pesky hitter. I'm really excited about him. We'll see what happens uh, in the draft with him. And, hey, Merry Kurtzmas is back. Five home runs this weekend, three on Sunday. Don't count the man out. I am, I know I'm biased, but I am not ready to give up on Nick Kurtz just yet. I'm just saying. Um, yeah. It, no it was, he today. he uh, Charlie Condon had a rough weekend. He had the typical Condon weekend. Yeah. Zana had a home run. We were both wrong, by the way, who would hit more home runs. I think Zana had the only home run. Out of all three of them, Condon. No, uh, Condon had a home run too. Zana. Okay, Condon so tied one. one. We think we both said Montgomery. I don't think he hit one, so there goes that. Game two, White Sox uh, and uh, Guardians. We've got Logan Allen and Mike Soroka, six ten. That'll be an interesting one. So stay tuned for that, and we'll break that down on Wednesday's Lockdown Guardians. Well, thank you for joining us. Remember, rate interview, download it helps. Be an every day or. Um, and thank you to everyone for all of your kind comments, uh, in the, after, for my 50 year anniversary and go, go guard.